Welcome. Um, Andre is a new friend of DSI Labs, who I got the chance to meet during our time at International Data Week about, what, two, three weeks ago? Um, it's, as you can tell from some of the links that he shared, he is also a uh, an IPFS enthusiast who would love to see the idea of content addressable storage applied to persistent identifiers. So um, I'll, I'll let Andre introduce himself for a second, but Andre, I think everyone on this call already understands the value of content addressable storage. So this is probably one where we can get into some of the nittier, grittier details of the specs that you've designed and just kind of discuss and see what people have to say. So with that being said, do you want to just give a quick introduction of yes. you, your background? Yes, yeah, for sure. So again, uh, my name is Andre. I'm uh, a data stewardship programmer and uh, a software developer of uh, Letra Synchrotron at EST, uh, which is a lab uh, in Italy that produces and uses uh, uh, synchrotron light. Uh, so the laboratory is producing a lot of data and we always had problems with uh, sharing the data, the analysis by pipelines and uh, the in intermediate data and uh, ident identificating all of the data we produce. So now we have a, uh, we have a, also an experimental IPFS node on our server room, and we are trying to find the easy and more or less convenient way for such a big facility to identify and to prove the origins of data. So this is what I am working. It's my side project after the expand the European Open Science Cloud uh, data sharing project ended in uh, the last year. And uh, this is what I am working uh, working at Eletra. Oh, well, for uh, for now, that's uh, that's all of my introduction. Uh, I'm also a, for, uh, a former uh, robotic scientist of uh, Bauman University in Moscow. So uh, also I'm. Now it's uh, totally a side and pet project. Uh, I am exploring the possibilities to share the data across the robotic, uh, let's say, robonomics. The content mm -hmm. addressing and uh, blockchain driven uh, networks of robots. But it's now not in the right. yeah, not in the in the stage yeah. on which we can discuss together. Okay, so uh, I yeah. think uh, I think we could start. Yeah, we should be able to. I'm gonna poke one question. I'm gonna throw in a chat asking for consent to record, just to make sure that that's okay. And in yeah. addition, we're hoping to maybe post these on the DSI Labs YouTube so that we can share this around in case people think that's interesting. Are you okay with that? Yes. Yes. Sure. Sweet. Thank you. Okay. So I will share now my screen. Uh, is, it frozen? is he frozen? Okay. He might be frozen. Yeah, I think that's okay. Let me just rejoin. There we go. Uh, you're on mute again, Andre. I, I lost thought my... I froze. <laughs> yes, I've lost my connection. So I will try to share the screen again. Maybe that's uh, something wrong with Zoom. And Do you have permission to? Yes, I have. Okay, good. But the graphics doesn't work, so probably. Can you hear me still? Um, if it's easier to share okay. the file or links, we can yes, share on I your will, uh, I will now send the link, uh, send the link to uh, DPID. Okay, I have the node, so I can share that. Okay. And this is the um, the Google Doc that you made around 
decentralized persistent identifiers. Oh, here we go. Okay. Yep, we can see it. Good to go. All right, feel free to kick it off and I'll try and move as you as you go. Let me know when you okay. want to switch. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. So it's uh, just a little talk about the persistent identification. And at first, about the design problems and uh, the specification proposal we made after uh, uh, the outcome of uh, Expanse project. Uh, can you move to the next, please? Yes. Yeah, so it's uh, at first, it's about the problems uh, we encounter at uh, identifying our data on uh, Electra Synchrotrone. And uh, the first is that was uh, for the ordinal infrastructures like DOIs, the identification and uh, that metadata binding to the all digital entities addressed by this persistent identifier are implemented over the existence agnostic uh, existence agnostic link. For example, DOI doesn't doesn't know which data and metadata it should address. It's just a link on which uh, the without underlying uh, database record, it doesn't work. So uh, it doesn't allow us to implement the uh, linking of the over the uh, metadata and uh, digital entities stored under the existing DOI, except uh, the cases when the DOI metadata should change. And also for uh, the uh, current state of the persistent identification, the identification provider is the only source of provenance. So for example, for again, for the, the DOI or handle, uh, we cannot uh, recreate it from the existing data or the digital object or the metadata. So we should just trust on the root authority of the identification provider. Then the, it's uh, uh, obviously leading that the resolution is declared as a unidirectional process. So again, the reverse lookup is not possible. Can you move to the next, please? And here is a, just a schematic of how the uh, centralized PID infrastructures are generally generally uh, developed and in, implemented right now. Uh, this scheme uh, is borrowed from our outcome in Expanse. You can see it on the Zenodo link I shared from uh, to the chat. And uh, it's a, it is actually probably the same for handle and uh, DOI infrastructures. Uh, next, please. After a, after exploration of this scheme, uh, on at, here at Eletra, me with some colleagues tried to develop the schema for the decentralized model. It's it is a first version of this schema. I also presented it on uh, the IPFS presentation at Eletra. I also shared the link, and uh, this is a let's say the decentralized architecture that uh, utilizes. Uh, hash functions, the selected set of the hash functions. Uh, RI is a research institution, our research infrastructure, which provides, uh, which acts as a both PID provider and a PID verification, uh, verification point. So this scheme is based on the uh, customer signatures, which is a cryptographic signature. Uh, hash functions and uh, uh, data your uh, actually data URI stored in IPFS and provided from the uh, PID affixes. Some of these are the ideas uh, encrypted in this uh, in this scheme also will be presented in uh, the specification. I will try to uh, to explain uh, also by the Google document. Uh, next, please. Uh, here are the expected key features we try to implement during de the development of our uh, specification proposal to avoid the problems we encountered from the centralized model of persistent identification. 
the let's say some key points here I would like to highlight uh, at first is that fire compliance because uh, uh, expanse project was dedicated to the fair data models and the data sharing under fair conditions and uh, this forced us to uh, to include this feature uh, and also to try to include uh, in this uh, in our uh, working model uh, underlying access control for example yielding uh, the access from uh, on the last mile from metadata to the actual digital entity to external access control solution at least to keep in mind this possibility and also uh, the second highlight I want to do is uh, the safety feature is a safety feature uh, because of the abusive usage of uh, for example doi now it seems possible because uh, uh, we can easily after the short do, uh, that data site shut down if i remember correctly this march we could easily imagine that the let's say the attacker could just capture a control over one of the uh, res uh, resolving nodes of DOIs and then use it in abusive way. So uh, we decided to try to think about the mechanisms providing the safety. And uh, the third point is uh, uh, transparency and reproducibility, the underlying reproducibility. So the key point here is all of the uh, network participants should be able to share the same software. In the ideal model, this software should always be uh, be supplied over the same persistent identification network. So here are the main highlights I wanted to do. Uh, please move it to the next slide. And here is a first model we developed. Uh, uh, for our PID concept, which it, for sure it could be changed and uh, under the conditions we would agree to establish. And uh, here are just, just the list. So we suppose to propose all, all the data over a network of the peers connected over IPFS network. And this IPFS network probably should be the only uh, transportation protocol the infrastructure should use. Uh, um, and Ellie, every sorry, interrupt, Andre. Ellie, can you scroll down further, please? Thank you. Yes. Sorry, keep going. Thank you. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, so, and uh, the next key feature is that every peer in the infrastructure should be able to work as untrusted resolver node and also to provide the public gateway public resolution gateway once he would decide for every valid PID uh, we would resolve over our infrastructure. Uh, the second highlight here is that uh, in our concept, it was a con uh, also the concept of subsets. So imagining our, our uh, PIDs, we were thinking about uh, some supersets which uh, would manage would be managed uh, over some uh, web of trust consisting of uh, some trusted peers and every operation over this uh, trusted peers should be ratified we are all agree mechanism that is as it is uh, described just just down below and also there would be the subsets and every subsets would be managed by uh, the dedicated peer. And this peer takes a responsibility to share the uh, lookup table for every PID uh, minted in, inside this subset. But, the, uh, but giving the peer the right to hold the subset and to make himself 
responsible over the subset should be ratified by, by all of the trusted peers of the network. So this was uh, an initial model. Then the trusted peers yields, yield the uh, management of the subset to the so-called publisher peers. And uh, the verification is done over the uh, I, uh, identic cont IPFS content IDs of all of the lookup tables shared over the infrastructure by all peers. This is a, let's say, native mechanism. We were thinking about developing this uh, uh, specification proposal. Uh, we could see also the full document, not, not already full, but uh, the document we developed at Eletra on the Google Doc uh, via the link shared in the email. Uh, please move to the next slide. And so we here, uh, here have three types of peers defined in our infrastructure. The trusted, peer, trusted peers uh, actually formulating the web of trust and they have all of the possible rights uh, which are existing in our infrastructure. The next type is a publisher peer who takes a responsibility to hold the subset inside the given superset of PIDs. And the key point here, uh, I want to highlight it now. It's also described below, but I want to highlight it now for the publisher peers that it also would be the subsets, for example, for uh, reversely compatible DOIs. And the PIDs of the uh, different types. For example, we could imagine the uh, DOI society registering a, a trusted peer or even the publisher peer in our infrastructure and dedicate to us some set of uh, already minted DOIs. And we can create a cross resolution lookup table. So this is why uh, why developing this specification proposal, we decided to uh, also include a publisher peer. And the other key feature is to that uh, every trusted peer has a right to declare some PID minted in the subset as verified or suspicious. So there is a, let's say, the native, me native mechanism to declare that uh, some PID is used in uh, perfectly properly or in, in an improper way. And but uh, it is uh, the question for being discussed in discussed uh, in future. And the ordinal ordinal peer is uh, an untrusted peer that has no right to publish or mint PIDs, but uh, it has a right to resolve, reproduce existing PIDs and retrieve the data, providing also these data and metadata over the public uh, resolution gateway. So here are the uh, types of peers we're, we're thinking about. Uh, please move to the next slide. The uh, second problem is an integrity maintenance inside this infrastructure we, uh, we are thinking about. Uh, the first point I already described, it's uh, uh, identical resolution table IDs. Actually, it's a content IDs inside uh, IPS, IPFS network. And uh, the mechanism here is maintained uh, via dedicating uh, several standardized, standardized set of the IPFS entry points for every peer in the network. We will see the description of this below. And uh, uh, this is a this is a highlight here. Also, the trusted peer can uh, declare the given PID as suspicious. But uh, there is also what uh, we were also thinking about the weighted mechanism. So it will be an open vote for some uh, some already minted PIDs. But uh, this uh, we have doubts about. Uh, let's say how this mechanism would work because the weighted mechanisms are vulnerable to uh for being used as uh let's say 
let's say uh, election election uh, election attack uh all this is uh, the next point is already described it's about sharing the same software over the whole infrastructure between all participants and uh, the other key feature also connected with the uh, IPFS feature of uh, minting IP, IPNS, interplanetary name system, uh, entry point keys, which are already signed by the node owner. So every ratification operation should be signed by the cryptographic key owned by the uh, trusted peers. So this is uh, a task probably sh should be solved, which probably should be solved. Uh, implementing the uh, infrastructure over our uh, specification we propose. Okay, please uh, move to the next slide. And here are the entry IPFS entry point we de declared for every peer in our infrastructure. And uh, this set of uh, entry points, every point should be in our suggestion, should be uh, implemented over the dedicated IPNS key because the publisher subscriber model is uh, already is still work in progress in by IPFS so we decided to implement this over the IPNS uh, public keys uh, the trusted peers list should be published identically by every trusted peer or in the network pending operations list is also should be published by every trusted peer and also every trusted peer publishes the list of supersets available inside the whole infrastructure. Uh, on the other side, the publisher peer publishes the subset. So that's a lookup list of uh, PIDs issued under the uh, subset on which this given publisher peer is responsible on. Uh, and now, uh, also, there are the lists of verified and suspicious PIDs available for the whole network. And uh, every publisher peer and every trusted peer should publish them and should verify their integrity. The broadcast is uh, just a mutable message that uh, the peer can publish, for example, for announcing something or uh, uh, make uh, really a broadcast like uh, it is done it is done in the uh, systems like uh, in the telegraph system like for example swift and uh, the last is a peer info uh, please uh, move to the next here are the highlights of, uh, we were thinking about uh, developing the mechanism to maintain network status consensus so they are uh, here are the some uh, social contracts uh, on which all of the participants should be obliged to do and uh, so the first is already described the identity of the ids content ids uh, here for the trusted peers list superset list and subset publishers list which are published on the, the entry point of every trusted peer and uh, also the, obliga the obligations for the peers, for example, for publisher peer, there is an obligation to ver not only to verify the integrity of trusted peer list, but also to verify the integrity of the subset publishers list. So it's a, uh, some, some, something like the collective responsibility here. And uh, every publisher peer signs its own uh, subset PIDs list by his own private key. It's also an, uh, an obligation. The untrusted peer to for, for being able to resolve the uh, PIDs, he should verify the integrity of everything before uh, act actually uh, running over all the trusted peers and checking the CIDs they are publishing on their entry points to, for being able to start 
the resolution of the PIDs. Uh, please move to the next slide. And uh, well, for now, it's uh, all highlights I wanted to do today. And uh, here are the discussion points for the future, because after the discussion with Eric and after studying the documentation of the uh, DPID project, uh, I uh, also together with my colleagues realized too that uh, some features are already already developed and uh, successfully implemented. So here are the uh, future disc discussion points. So the uh, close integration with uh, your project seemed to be really feasible and really useful for every one of us because uh, the features we have uh, already already have them. Uh, the next point, it was proposed by Eric. Thanks a lot, Eric, for uh, bringing this up, uh, that we should minimize the social contracts inside the inside the spec. Once, uh, but uh, thinking about this, I think uh, it is a topic for the next uh, for the for the discussion. Okay, can you please uh, scroll a bit down? No, 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 no. Just, just like this, please. Uh, I Sorry. think. Yeah. Off earlier. Yeah. yeah. I, I think uh, we also should. Uh, we also should uh, keep in mind that we would provide some subset in our PID infrastructure for the societies controlled by the Web of Trust principle. For example, like it is done now for the peer-reviewed materials in the DOI society or the, uh, for example, Software Heritage Society, which is also brings up the question about the compatibility with the, not only with uh, uh, reverse lookup, but also with the uh, virtual control systems like Git. Uh, the next is uh, to systematize and uh, systematize the operations that should be available for every participant of the network, which, which is already, already uh mostly done in your project so the integration will be again a very good idea and uh and what i didn't see now uh, as a possibility for, uh, in your project and what we would really uh really would strive to do is the uh cross resolution cross resolution and dedication of some subset of our uh pid let's say, uh, PID space for the uh, cross-resolution at first for the DOIs, because the DOI is most popular, uh, popular persistent identifier right now. Uh, well, so for now, uh, that they are all highlights. Uh, we can just uh, leave this slide on. Uh, thank you very much for listening, and uh, let's now start the discussion. And uh, for we can uh, we can discuss the exact uh, specification proposal we have on the Google Documents. Uh, if you if you want, you can uh, share the screen with the uh, Google Doc. Yeah, for sure. Sure. And okay. I guess maybe to kick off the discussion. Um, I'll actually call on Cena maybe to yes, unmute sir. himself and potentially give some thoughts. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you, Andre, for the presentation. And yeah, definitely uh, we have a lot of similar lines of, of thinking on, on how we're uh, implementing um, these sorts of systems. Uh, I, I do, I do want to uh, maybe ask a couple questions around. Yes. Uh, yeah. So I want to, I want to ask a couple questions around um so so number one uh i wanted to ask about uh how are the trusted peers chosen it, it, uh, what, how would you um think through that uh, well um for, for my point of view it's only my opinion right now because i discussed it with the colleagues but we didn't uh, agree on anything uh mm -hmm. in my opinion it should be like uh like the following the first uh let's say the trusted peer running at first, the system, for example, it would be Eletra or the other uh, large, large-scale research facility. Mm -hmm. uh, it runs the software, 
runs the public resolution gateway as it is done, for example, in your project. And mm -hmm. uh, it starts to communicate with the other facilities, uh, uh, and for example, universities, mm -hmm. to enter the network and to ratify the operation for including the next trusted peers in uh, the web of trust. Mm -hmm. So okay. the first the first ratification would be done only by uh, one or two participants, and afterwards uh, it should be all agreed. Mm -hmm. So this gotcha. is a mechanism we mentioned. Okay, and then uh, and then the other question I had was related more into like the implementation around the actual PID itself, and and you know you mentioned something about IPNS as being a potential way to implement it. Uh, is that correct? Yes. Yes, exactly. Okay. okay. So, so my understanding of IPNS, and, and correct me um, here if, if uh, I'm, I'm wrong, but I believe the implementation of IPNS as it stands today is effectively a pointer um, that you can update to a CID effectively. So it's like yes. a name that, that can be pointed to a CID and you can, you can mutate that name uh, at any point, right? Yeah. Exactly, exactly yeah. this. Yeah, but uh, the, the, also the very important point here is that uh, the private key mm -hmm. should not be shared. So, sure. yes, so uh, every IPNS entry point should be owned by only the only single peer. Okay. And this yeah, is the point. Yeah. Okay. And then, and then uh, so my question kind of around this particular point, this particular implementation with IPNS is the, you know, if it, the ability to audit the change. Um, so let's say I publish a change. So I have an, like an IPNS name and it points to CID one. And then all of a sudden I make a point to CID two and then I make a point to CID three, three and so on. How do I capture these changes um, in a verifiable way, in a, in a tamper proof way uh, uh, so that well, I can guarantee against, uh, you know, c uh, content drift. Uh, yeah, this is, a uh, uh, for, for now, it seemed uh, from uh, maybe, maybe Eric or anyone else could correct me if I am wrong, but uh, studying the IPFS documentation, I saw that probably it's still not solved the issue mm -hmm. inside the IPFS network. Uh, mm -hmm. So it is uh, um, the question for for the discussion about should okay. we use uh, exactly the IPNS or not? Okay, got it, got it. Okay, and uh, and then I'd say uh, one one thing that you know I, maybe I can talk a, a bit about how we've been approaching PIDs and 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 kind of um, you know our current approach the, on the protocol, and and so I think um, in our in our you know, kind of vision and in the, in the, in the, the what we've currently been working on, it's almost like every single user is an untrusted user, basically. And, mm -hmm. and, and basically every single user has the ability to, with their own um, private key, uh, sign a, a, you know, some, some uh, message and, um, and as soon as they sign the message um, and they publish that to the network, that becomes that the identifier of that first message becomes a PID that all subsequent updates can be uh, linked to that so that every single new update is linked to that original um, submitted PID. And, and that actually solves the problem of uh, provenance tracing uh, and then, and then the issue then is, um, is so, and also that's a cryptographic, uh, function, um, that, that produces that initial identifier. And what that does is it makes it so that, um, anybody without any permission can begin publishing PIDs. Um, and then, and then the question is, okay, which ones are, you know, junk or noise or follow a schema that is relevant, uh, to science, right. Or to research, mm -hmm. and and for that uh, we're using a a way of indexing uh, based on the actual content of the message, uh, as, uh, so that you when you publish a message, um, if it follows a certain schema, 
you know, you choose a schema that it follows. And then every single message that follows a certain schema, you can actually query for all messages that are published with that schema. And once a message has been initially published with a schema, uh, the schema is pretty much uh, constant throughout the, the, the life cycle of the, um, of, the, of the object, of the PID. And this has an, uh, an interesting property of, uh, for the findability uh, part of, of FAIR, um, where, where you can actually, it actually, you, you have no opinion on whether people are publishing junk um, because you can simply filter by schema, right? And so certain applications can, oh, I see you're pulling something up here. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. Uh, okay, so yeah, so exactly. I, I think so, this is Ellie's for you. Okay, yeah, so She might so, be sharing yeah. her personal notes. Oh, okay. So, so yeah, basically. Um, no, Ellie, would you mind going back to the actual presentation with the questions that are up? Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So, so basically, the the way of doing it with uh, in this in this manner, where where it's uh, actually completely open and permissionless to to begin publishing data, and then you have these schemas, where we're then any user, any external user, not, you know, who's consuming the data can then query by schema, then all of a sudden they can find the most relevant content that they're interested in, right? And and that helps you eliminate uh, noise and junk and, and so on, right? And then, and then, I, uh, I think, sorry, go for it. Sorry. I thought you were done. My oh, bad. oh, um, Okay, so so, but basically, um, another another concern in, in a decentralized system is going to be network partitions. So, what happens if certain nodes go offline, or um, you know, do you have to pick some sort of way to to shard the data because not every node has unlimited um, storage capacity. So, there's going to be probably some sharding of of, of data, and um, you know, in in uh, in that model, it may be actually appropriate for certain uh, agents who are interested in preserving certain content to be constantly running queries for these schemas, and then actually um, registering them. And uh, in our case, we're registering them on on a on, uh, well, on a blockchain, um, while well, using a smart contract, and the reason why is because uh, you can run, you can maybe publish objects with a certain schema, but later if they go offline, then there's no record of that object necessarily uh, if the data becomes unavailable. However, if you have certain agents continually querying and indexing the objects that they're interested in at least for the metadata, maybe not the all the source data, if the peers go offline, uh, but at least to contain the metadata. If you do that in a permissionless way uh, where anybody can add, add you know, records, um, you know, for, for all the objects that match a certain schema, then you're actually able to tolerate network partitions. And also, um, I believe that's one of the, one of the fair principles. It's like, even if the data goes offline, at least, have a record of the metadata, right? And so that's like a, one, one of the things that we've been thinking about. And then I'd say um, another thing is just to talk about, um, oh, there's two things on the web of trust in terms of validating PIDs, um, and then also with the DOI compatibility. Um, so two separate things. So kind of my, my view on, on the web of trust is it's gonna be really tough to, to regulate uh, content uh, creation in terms of like, you can have several agents, you know, producing content and it's very cheap to produce content. Regulating that content uh, in terms of like making sure it's valid and, and so on, it's, it's um, probably quite tough, uh, like a lot of effort required to do that. So I'd say like allow anybody to publish whatever content and then, um, and then you know you, we can index certain schemas, and then for the, the most relevant schemas, if you want to then uh, did, like do some validation to determine if that schema is actually you know even if it fulfills a schema it could still be junk, 
well, then I think you could actually have that social element where, um, you know, perhaps experts in certain fields, perhaps with public profiles, uh, review the content and actually issue a, uh, an attestation to that content saying, hey, I validated it. And I think you were kind of alluding to something like this um, in the kind of web of trust part of things. And yeah, we, we definitely think that that is a component. Um, and then and then I'd say also on the DOI side, I agree. Uh, you know, having some sort of bridge so that you can resolve DOIs and perhaps even upgrade DOIs so that you can take uh, perhaps some research because we all we all know the issues with DOIs. They, you know, they can suffer from uh, link rot, so they can 404. Uh, they don't really support versioning. There's been like sort of band-aid solutions. You know, if you look at uh, cross rev or cross mark that attempt to to track um, version updates over time, but those aren't cryptographically guaranteed um, solutions. So we can actually do cryptographically guaranteed solutions uh, for you know basically taking a DOI, allowing somebody to claim it, um, you know via via some um, you know wh whether we can. There's a, a couple ways that we can actually do the claiming. Uh, I think that could be interesting. Um, you know, so there's plenty more to be discussed on, on that part of it, um, you know, to prevent spoofing and that sort of thing. But I do think that there isn't, a, you know, there, there could be a mechanism to claim a DOI and then actually register it and then allow a, a group or one or one or more people to actually up uh, push updates to it and then have that record be able to receive an attestation in from like a, a like on the social layer of actual like researchers who, who are familiar with the work to actually put a public profile and issue an attestation saying hey yes indeed this doi is the real one and boom we've upgraded it to a decentralized one that has uh cryptographically verified version tracking and oh boom we added a bunch of data to it and here's how it's all linked together oh and it can um it can actually accumulate social markers um kind of boosting its 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 reputation so i think a lot of these points kind of like align in in the spirit uh, of what we're trying to accomplish and uh i think it comes down to like you know diving into the the nitty-gritty technical uh details and and kind of going through all the work of um you know walking through all these points but in general that's kind of an overview of what I've been thinking about and happy to, to dive into more or have, um, you know, give more details on, on any component. Uh, okay, okay, thank you. And um, I want what I wanted to say uh, at first about the, uh, let's say, the web of trust to verify some, some subsets of PIDs. Uh, because what we already already encountered in the scientific society is the uh, let's say predatory. So, for example, the predator, predatory uh, journals publishing and minting DUIs for uh, junk articles, and uh, this is an aspect in which uh, what what you have proposed the uh, schema based uh, aggregation. It, it perfectly works for uh, eliminating the, let's say, noise content, but it doesn't work against this. Uh, this was uh, the thing we were keeping in mind, uh, trying to develop the uh, web of trust and the ratification mechanism. So, but well, uh, it's uh, the question we should, we should discuss deeper because there are a lot of aspects underlying. Yeah, I agree. And I think a big part of it, to be honest, is the linking of a public profile along with yes. that uh, marker of, of quality or verification. Yes, I agree. I agree. Uh, but also it should, uh, I think, I think it could be in the, uh, not for the whole infrastructure, but only for the subset, it would be also the possibility, for example, to link and uh, as, as it is now, already possible in the DPID to link the reviews for the project with reviews should be should be uh, let's say uh, uh, cryptographically signed but this signature should not be should not be visible to anyone again uh, anyone except the author 
or the admin of a given PID. This is one, why, of the, why, one of the ways I see. Why, why, why would you avoid uh, sharing the signature publicly? Because uh, you know the mechanism of uh, peer review. In uh, oh, I see. In, except the the situation of when the reviewer wants to share his uh, his name and personal information, <laughs> the uh, entity, the digital most uh, digital or material entity of review should not be discovered. I see. I see that. I, I yeah. I I could see that. I, it, so you're saying like, let me let me see if I'm understanding it correctly, that there's value in issuing some sort of you know quality signal from an expert, but then without revealing your identity. Is that the idea? Uh yes. Okay, but then it wouldn't it also be valuable to reveal your identity or or what are the you mentioned some negative aspects of revealing the identity i, I just want to understand um exactly what those are it sounds like maybe it, it, you could be competitive um uh, yes know. it could be it okay. could be competitive it could be competitive it could be in the let's say in the state of racing between two uh for example two reviewers or mm -hmm. it could be also the review uh, reviewing uh, attack on some uh, some PID. Mm -hmm. So and it's again the social aspect, and this is why again uh, we were trying to think about the mm -hmm. web of trust in uh, in this aspect. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. I think uh, giving the option, I think to, to allow for some sort of you know issuance of a signal of quality or some signal that you know somebody has reviewed it um that's that's definitely uh, with with the option to reveal your identity right um so yes. you could you could maybe perhaps not reveal it or you could reveal it uh depending on the situation and yes. i think that option is is yeah i i could i could see that being very useful i could also see being very useful potentially being able to along with that signal of quality be able to potentially use something like a um a proof or, or some ability to attach some 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 data that shows hey uh maybe i belong to maybe i can show that i, I belong to an organization so you have different more granular levels of um of uh information sharing so maybe it's like i don't share my name but i share an organization that I belong to, and you know, I can uh, potentially there's ways to to actually verify that, um, you know, from uh, with a third party. Um, you know, you could I could also see potentially, um, you know, if we look at the current scientometric machine, um, yeah. where where we have all these different, um, you know, um, scores and mechanisms of of kind of like ranking uh, research. Uh, productivity and and you know there could be potentially the ability to uh, sign it with like an H index bucket, <laughs> for example. Well, it's a, like it's a good example. It's good example. Uh, I don't know now. Uh, I cannot even even think about uh, how feasible it would be. But uh, what I would tell that uh, we have already a problem of identification for the facility itself. And for example, sharing the metadata about some organization, it should be a way to link also the IDs of the, of the researchers. And this should be a, a possibility, I think, I think mm -hmm. in the PID infrastructure, there should be a possibility, as you saw, as, uh, as, as you mm -hmm. said right now, uh, to reveal the, uh, exactly the researcher acting from the side of uh, of the facility, mm -hmm. and you, and you could also do something potentially very interesting, where you have uh, self selected groups of organizations that all say, "Hey, we trust each other." So it's like yeah. perhaps several different universities that say, "Hey, we're like it's almost like um, like you know in sports they have different uh, leagues, you know, where it's like, "Hey, we're all in the same league, right? We all self selected and we all agree that we're all in the same league, right?" And so we all issue to each other, "Hey, we're all in the same bucket." And perhaps exactly. there's a way to say, hey, instead of revealing that I belong to University X or Organization Y, 
I can say I belong to this group of highly trusted organizations, and therefore I can issue you a quality signal that comes from that group, but you can you don't know exactly which organization or which individual it was. And it could be up to the issuer to, to you know, provide that level of granularity um, as a choice. Yes, exactly. And this is a very important point. Thank you for bringing it up because uh, in uh, our in our uh, specification proposal, we thought about only one web of trust. So you are bringing, bringing up the idea of uh, using the several web of trusts, not for given subsets for, of PIDs, but just in the infrastructure itself. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, it seems for me a really a very good idea. Yeah, just I think it's a good, exactly. Go for it. I just wanted a quick clarification question in terms of the web of trust thing. So what you were saying, Andre, is um, that specifically we were thinking of a web of trust, like what this conversation does is it builds from a web of trust just into what you were thinking, which is right before publishing. It's like who gets to publish. And now we also have a web of trust after publishing, which determines what is relevant. Uh, yes, uh, yes, and uh, this is what uh, this is. This was an idea just uh, brought up right now. So mm -hmm. in our uh, first specification proposal, it there were, uh, were no this idea. So uh, uh, thanks again. It's uh, for me. It seems really a good point. Yep, and I think it also lends it creates more credibility if you have um, the creation of these groups and also the the publishing be effectively permissionless with yes uh, with like varying levels of quality signaling that you can choose to provide right and that's how you stand out and making it very easy to query so that a consumer of the information can choose hey i want to ignore all this garbage because i know it comes from like a chinese paper mill right and yes. or or it just doesn't follow a schema or i know that this you know nobody's vetting these guys Right, so I'm just going to ignore it. Yes, uh, well, exactly. I understood what you what you said. Uh, yes, yeah, it's, it, it's about about this, and also and also, uh, in in my opinion, about the organization, this uh, kind of of league or something like this, uh, acting as a reviewer. So the level of trust for these uh, these uh, network organizations, which would, should be quite higher, even for example, for the single university. I, I agree. And then and then what's also interesting about this dynamic is if any individual within that group misbehaves, then the group should have the option of removing the organization that that individual belongs to. And that could be a really interesting social mechanism to align good behavior potentially. Yes, yes, but here, here I guess uh, it would be uh, also a good idea of the ratification uh, ratification mechanism. Not, uh, I, I don't yes, think exactly. it would be useful to, for, to use a, uh, all agree model, but uh, we could think about the other models. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think what's really super interesting about this too, is if you make it very flexible, because every organization and group of organizations has their own culture. If you make it very flexible, then, you know, you can leave it up to these groups to kind of, you know, give them the tools on how to organize and how to manage their own you know, organization and, and, and individuals. And then what would be really cool is like you, you fast forward 10 years, 20 years, and then you see which ones are the best models that actually survive over time, which, which I think is like probably the, the, the most realistic way to actually see what works, the quickest way to actually see what works and the, the most, tr it's like a free market mechanism effectively for, yes. for social proof, yeah. All the common evolution mechanism, uh, probably, probably uh, because I am now establishing some uh, small group of uh, scientists uh, working working on the persistent identification. Probably it would be also a really good opportunity to discuss with uh, uh, the scientists working on inside the infrastructure of DOIs and handle. 
because we have uh, we have them in our uh, small mailing list maybe it would be really a good uh, let's say sightseeing for us about how the models of uh, trust and the models of uh, uh, minting and uh, quality signals uh, evolve yeah ma makes total sense and i think it's it's really interesting too because you see the like i i've often like put myself in the shoes of those folks who i don't know how many years ago 20, 20 30 years ago uh you know had designed um the handle system for example where these are their organization scoped um identifiers um and and i and i you know and i've actually talked to um I don't know if you know Arcs, Arc Institute, John, John Coons over there. And he's he's actually been super um, invaluable in, in teaching me a bit, a bit of the history um, and walking me through all the kind of design decisions. And then I, you know, I present some things that we're, we're thinking about with, um, you know, technology available today. And it's just like, I wonder what they would, given the landscape of options that we have and, and the ability, you know, to cryptographically sign things um, in an in a easy way and actually like compose a lot of these uh, cryptographic primitives together. I wonder what they would come up with given that new information. Yeah, it's a really an inter interesting topic and uh, well, maybe, maybe we would uh, find an opportunity to, to uh, talk with these persons who are already, already involved uh, in the in these infrastructures and to have some knowledge for them about, uh, about how would we adopt and uh, implement, for example, the reverse, reverse uh, lookup compatibility, because every centralized structure would, uh, would degrade. Yes, I'll, although with the reverse lookup, are you talking about like being able to have an index that goes from CID to PID? Uh, I uh, Not only this, but also as uh, I, des I described in the presentation, for being able to uh, de to dedicate the, the, the subset of the whole PID space, uh, for example, for cross uh, resolution of DOIs and backing mm. up and backing up mm -hmm. the DOIs, some DOIs as uh, the, uh, let's say, side effect backup solution. Yeah, I see what you're saying. So that yeah. actually could make sense because- yes, I, um, I believe. Yeah, because if the, it's basically a way to onboard legacy organizations into this model. Yes, yes, exactly. And uh, this is what, uh, for example, here at Eletra, we should always keep in mind because we have uh, a lot of legacy legacy systems and uh, even the identification systems. Mm -hmm. For example, we, we have a need uh, to identify the uh, tape data storage uh, libraries and the mm -hmm. elements of these libraries, for example. To communicate, to communicate with the system in a manual way, not in the auto, uh, automatized way. Yep, that, that because the system, so they, they, these systems, uh, let's say they are some, uh, they should be in uh, somehow replaced in some years, and no one yeah. knows how to handle how to handle a lot of uh, uh, storage entities. Mm. Without, yeah, that's really, uh, that's really interesting, and I I could actually see a way to do this in a self serve capacity potentially. So my understanding, for example, of the DOI system is that you can register for an organization namespace, and what I could see is actually the development of a of a toolkit that allows you to uh, import like backfill all your existing. Uh, PIDs into a, you know, cryptographically verifiable storage, um, you know, system, uh, and then be able to then uh, make that available for future use. So it could be actually seamless. And I could even see the verification of that being very similar to how you verify a domain name using DNS records. You could publish like a specific identifier using your organizational uh, namespace. 
And then that could be the verification required for the system to, to signal that it's actually legit. It could be exactly. Yes, exactly. I, I, I see the same, this, uh, actually the same model mm -hmm. of uh, reverse, reverse lookup and cross resolution because, well, uh, the society really needs this. That's no, I totally agree. Agree. totally agree. This is really cool. Yeah. And, so, uh, so, yeah, the DOI, um, you know, compatibility problem has been something that's, you know, we've been, kept, we've kept bringing up, but it's one of those things that we're like, you know, we have a couple of different ideas, um, but we're still a little bit, um, we, we haven't gone, gotten down to it and experimented with actually implementing it. And one of my concerns is, you know, how do you actually get, um, how do you actually properly be able to claim it without people spoofing it, right? And there, I have some thoughts in mind, but I, I you know, so one of them is like, you know, look up, um, you know, look up the actual record, resolve the PDF content, or look it up on Crossref, right? And then extract the ORCIDs from there, and then give it an ORCID uh, authenticated user that belongs to that uh, work, allow them to claim it, right? And yeah. so my concern, I think it's kind of a cool idea, but my concern with that is the you know there's a lot of pitfalls with like on a per journal like a per publisher basis and a per organizational basis and also a per field basis like the culture of actually attaching orchid identifiers to your paper may not be pr present in certain fields or certain organizations um you know it could be maybe email addresses that could also be a potential one but then you also have to think about okay i'm dealing with potentially looking at pdfs and then having to parse them. And also keeping in mind that these PDFs could be updated at any point. Um, so there's, there's a bit, bunch of complexity there. But if the organizations themselves were involved somehow, that could be um, potentially a more reliable way to, of doing it. Sure, I, I totally agree about the organizations, but um, uh, about the existing persistent identifiers, uh, what I would say, Probably, probably, in my opinion, we could look at first uh, for the API uh, exposed by the providers of these PIDs and look uh, around calculating the, for example, the IPFS content ID over the existing reply from the API. So to determine the constant, constant part of the reply. For most of the uh, it's a uh, probably more a more technical way, but uh, for most uh, existing persistent identifiers like handle and DOI, uh, this should be enough to to prevent to track uh, to track the changes in the uh, API reply, and uh, potentially to prevent some uh, cases of uh, of spoofing. Yeah. Maybe, yeah, also because we have a content ID uh, available for all uh, IPFS network, it could be perfectly easy to verify. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I think uh, I think that's the first thing we can uh, we can keep in mind thinking about this uh, this possibility. And just a little remark, uh, because well, I'm Russian, and I I know that uh, now Russia is. Uh, Apply, applying a lot of resources for spoofing and for, uh, let's say, let's say uh, unexpected changes in the URI resolve, uh, resolving model. I could say that uh, probably the only kind of a system that could withstand with this uh, coordinated efforts of on spoofing uh, is a decentralized system. So I think even building the webs of trust, uh, we should not uh, we should not allow the system to for for being uh, being torn apart between the webs of trust. So the system uh, should be always uh, interconnected between all nodes. Yes. Otherwise, yeah. something yeah. about like publish like republishing 
the lists amongst all yes. nodes. Yeah. Yes, and this is why uh, it was my idea initially. I wrote in uh, our uh, specification proposal about the identity of all the CIDs for trusted peers list, uh, uh, publisher peer list, the pending operations, and uh, so on. This is uh, uh, this is why I decided to to include this, uh, and uh, I think the verification should be one of the few uh, social obligations for every participant in uh, this decentralized infrastructure. Because otherwise, uh, all of us, all of the participants would be uh, vulnerable to the, uh, to the spoofing. Yes, uh, I think, I think uh, it's interesting if you, if you allow like a gradient of uh, signals of, you know, for me to, to consent to giving you uh, like, a, you know, incremental signals of who I actually am, you know, and I think we, we discussed a little bit about this earlier. It's like being able to reveal portions of your identity um, and also being able to vouch for others, uh, you know, those, those could all be very useful tools. Uh, well, yeah, here, here I could say that uh, I completely agree. Okay. And I saw that, uh, oh, ah, okay, uh, it's already passed one, one hour and 10 minutes. Yeah, um, I actually am going to have to leave it in just a second. Um, Andre, I think we as a team would love the opportunity to continue this conversation with you past this seminar. Um, I'll reach out to you afterwards. It may take a few days because I'm fully engrossed in where I am at the moment. Um, but if at all possible, let's continue this because I think that there's a lot more to discuss. And hopefully this is something where we can coordinate efforts around some of the stakeholders in that email list because you're right. Yeah. Um, if we can do this hand in hand with DOI, it's going to make things a lot faster and a lot more effective than if we just do it on our own. Um, yes. so yeah, totally, totally on board. Um, Sina, do you have any closing thoughts for all of this? Oh, I just really appreciate, um, you know, it's, it's, it's quite a treat to see all this, uh, work, uh, done in, in your slides and your, in your documentation, Andre, I really appreciate your presentation. And it's great to see uh, people who, who are deeply thinking about these problems uh, as well and super exciting to, you know, to start this conversation. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, one, one question I want to, uh, to address. Uh, may, uh, may you share with me the recording of this, uh, of this seminar to share in our, uh, in our mailing list with the other participants from the uh, scientific institutions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Ah, okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Perfect. Well, with that being said, um, thank you for taking the time today. Uh, this has been a pleasure, and it is actually really fun to hear about other people who have been thinking about the same topics. So um, with that being said, we'll follow up with the uh, recording, and I'll follow up via email probably sometime early next week. Yes. And uh, yeah, Hope so. we'll talk to you soon. Yes. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for Bye. your attention. And have a good day. Thank you.